All right, we're going to get started here. Hi, everyone. Welcome to LAC's fifth annual Legal Aid Technology Summit. My name is Jenna Mowit. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I am the training coordinator here at LAC. This is our first time doing a virtual tech summit. So thank you all for your patience as we are changing formats and quickly learning how to use Zoom. Uh, we know that many of you are quickly learning how to migrate to online platforms as well. So um, this is one of the many reasons why this conversation is so timely. Today, we hope to facilitate a helpful conversation about how legal aid organizations are using tech tools mm -hmm. to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and provide support to clients and teams remotely. This is one of many conversations that is happening nationally, locally, and statewide. And one of our goals today is to make sure that the information is shared freely and everyone feels plugged in. Let's see. Um, we recognize that many of you may have heard this information before. So if you have, we hope that you walk away from today feeling like you've done your, your due diligence. We wanna thank Fenwick and West for their generous sponsorship. Because of them, we were able to make the Tech Summit free for anyone interested in attending. Before we begin, I wanna mention a few logistical notes. If you are not speaking, please mute yourself. If you have a question, please type it in the chat box to everyone and we will do our best to answer all of your questions. If you are interested in speaking on one of the panels or have volunteered to speak on one of the panels, uh, when you introduce yourself to the group, please um, say your name, your organization, and your pronouns. If you have yet to volunteer, um, please do so via the chat box um, if you'd like to speak on a panel and indicate which portion you would like to speak to. If you are having any technical difficulties, please make sure your output microphone or speaker is linked to the correct device. For example, if you're using headphones, make sure your output microphone and speaker is set to connect to your headphones. Please feel free to email me, jmowat at lockonline.org, or send me a private chat with any tech questions and I will do my best to help. This meeting is being recorded and we will send out notes and a captioned recording of the meeting within the next few days to everyone who has registered. If you did not register but would like to access these resources, please send me an email. And now I will pass it off to LAC's Executive Director, Selena Copeland. Hi, everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, <laughs> I think this is so interesting because we've been doing the Tech Summit now. This is our fifth year. And we originally designed them to be in-person opportunities for people to get together who don't typically get together. Um, frequently, it's executive directors who may gather at various conferences and the folks in the office who have to make tech decisions, um, whether it's about how to find funding for technology or how to train um, the other staff on how to use technology, you didn't often have a place to get together and talk to each other. So the first one we did was back in um, San Francisco. And I remember one of the funniest panels was about how to train um, attorney staff on how to do simple things like use the scanner. Um, staff were just tired of telling attorneys over and over again how to use the scanner. Um, so I feel like we've moved forward from that, but we're now in um, a very different reality where folks are now using a lot of technology at home. We don't have the same access to technology in our home. Many people out throughout the state who had really reliable internet in their offices are now um, working off of home internet that may be less fast and less secure. So there are different challenges now, but I, I do feel like we've moved beyond some of the kind of basic questions from five years ago. This was originally planned to, of course, to be an in-person all-day event with a lot of breakout sessions. But as um, all of you who've been on a conference call for more than two hours over the past several days know, um, it's just impossible. Um, everybody loses interest and you lose the, the train of the, the overall purpose of the meeting. So we compressed this to two hours to make sure we hit the biggest issues. Um, I see uh, several executive directors who are on here and that's fantastic. I know that um, there have been regional phone calls and regional gatherings, as Jenna mentioned, where people are sharing resources. But we wanted to open this up to a much broader group because now is a time where people can share what technology has been really working right now, what technology is failing now because the systems are completely overloaded and it worked really well for you a month ago, but horrible now. 
Um, so we really encourage people just to share what worked and what didn't work. And if everything that you are using now is the perfect thing that everyone else is using and recommends, well then great. Like you have made sure that there's not something else better out there. Um, but if you hear ideas from someone else, for the most part, you can see who is, um, who is talking just by hovering over. So you can um, reach out to them individually afterwards, or if you don't know how to reach someone, um, ask Jenna for that person's email address. Because we want to make sure that if, for example, Jenny Farrell says, you know, I tried this technology, it's awful, um, and then you don't catch what it is, but it sounds familiar to something you were considering, you can reach out to her and find out what it was. Um, so I'm, I'm like all of you going to participate, going to learn. We're a tiny office where all of us are now working from our homes. Um, and for those of you in the Bay Area, we just found out that the Bay Area schools are closed until May 1st. So um, this is a new reality. And um, I feel like every phone call, every Zoom meeting, every Skype call begins with that acknowledgement that we all have to be kind um, and patient with each other. And especially on these video conferences, if you see um, children and pets and loved ones in the background, just pretend they're not there. Um, so thank you everyone for taking the time. I know everyone's really busy, but I'm hoping we could all learn from each other. And because this is being recorded, if you have to step out for any point in time, you can always catch up later. And I, I have reviewed the, um, the you know, chats um, from this afterward from other recordings. It's very easy to follow along with who said what. Um, so if you didn't catch earlier, I'm Selena, the executive director of LAC, and my pronouns are she, her. And I will mute myself for the majority of this call. Thank you, Selena. Hi, everyone. My name is Theo Seren. I'm the Senior Technology and Program Associate here at LAC, and my pronouns are they, them, theirs. So just give a very quick overview of what we're planning on doing today. We want to start the first portion, which is our general group conversation um, in small groups about how your organization has been coping, what sort of strategies you've been doing to respond to COVID-19, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Well, the second portion will be sort of informal panels looking at solutions. Uh, so to begin that, we're going to be working with Charlie Gillick, who in this original iteration of the tech conference was going to be leading a session on disaster preparedness. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to him in a moment to give a brief overview of what his organization has been doing to sort of set the tone for when you're in your smaller groups about what to be thinking about and what to be talking about. Um, and then the plan with that is we'll be in small groups for, I believe, 10 minutes and then come back and then each group will be asked to share the key takeaways uh, from what their group conversation um, unearthed. And then in the interest of general time, we're going to ask that when folks are sharing those key takeaways, if other groups already touched on a lot of the issues that you've been experiencing, just to reference that as opposed to going in great detail again. Uh, your experiences are important, but we're trying to cram in a lot of material into a very short amount of time. So I'm going to pass it over to Charlie uh, to briefly talk about what he and his organization have been doing. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Theo. Uh, I'm Charlie Gillig. I'm Director of Legal Technology at Neighborhood Legal Services of LA County. Uh, pronouns he, his, him. Um, I, I'm really uh, impressed by how many people are on this. We have 86, 87 right now, um, and a lot of friendly faces from all over the state. I even see uh, Artemisa from Casa Cornelia over there. We haven't seen in about 10 years. Hi, Artemisa. Um, and so, you know, welcome, everybody. And as uh, Theo said, you know, I was originally going to give a presentation on uh, our disaster work. I wish NLS and myself had spent way more time on our disaster preparedness for this, um, because I think like everybody here, we've been sort of cobbling together solutions. We had some things in place, but obviously um, much of this has been unexpected and has been fly by the seat. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about my experience at NLS to maybe set a framework for some of our later discussions. I personally am very excited to hear all of your solutions. Uh, every single day, um, we are trying to address new things. And yesterday I sent an email out about e-faxing solutions that um, we weren't sure what the best uh, options were and you know, have moved forward quickly on that. So you know, I really hope to learn from you all. I understand every organization has different sizes and different challenges. Um, and you know, I'm excited to um, uh, hear your thoughts. I did want to say really briefly, I don't have a lot of time, but I just want to make sure everyone's taking care of themselves. You know, as someone who has um, been receiving a lot of emails in the last week uh, and a lot of people under stress, I know that that can have an effect on, on you all. And so just please be mindful of your self-care and, and those of your colleagues. Um, 
So in terms of NLS, we're, a, we're an LSE funded fairly large organization, 161 employees. Um, as this started, you know, my concern was really, how do we get day-to-day -day operations running with every single person remote? Um, and so, you know, that's kind of where my framework is and has been the last two weeks. I will say that we're now in the sort of transition phase of, okay, now everyone's up and running, but what is this going to look longer term? Because a lot of our solutions, frankly, are stopgap and aren't comprehensive. Um, I, I don't have as much to say about that. We're in the middle of kind of transitioning to that longer term plan. Um, in terms of our like short term goals, there's sort of a few major groups that we had to think about. Um, and by the way, if you have it, if you want to follow up with me, please reach out to me anytime. I think my email will be available if you want to hear more details, because this is going to be a brief overview or, um, you know, we'll talk in the smaller groups. So goal one was sort of like, how do we actually get people remote, uh, which included for us, like a self-help court system, a very extensive self-help court system at nine different locations that is now completely remote. Um, and so, you know, one piece of that as a starting point was just creating a telecommuting policy. I don't know if you all have created those. We spent quite a bit of time crafting, finalizing, running by our leadership to make sure that we had that. I can um, you know, distribute if people are interested. Uh, a second piece was remote desktop. Uh, so how do we ensure uh, client data security and also that individuals have access to their files um, and getting those set up on a lot of personal computers or, or other devices at home. Um, we did have some equipment from our disaster work and from other projects. So a big part was setting staff up with equipment that maybe didn't have devices at home, uh, which invited, involved setting those up, some training, distributing. Uh, we, we, we luckily had recently purchased an asset tracking software that we were able to use. Uh, phones, like how, you know, for us, we had sort of interesting um, uh, issues regarding like, who could use phones, whether reimbursement was necessary, and, and trying to figure out some of those challenges. Um, another piece was how do we get hotlines up? We have a very extensive hotline system. Uh, you know, can our phone system distribute those to individuals? The answer was no. We ended up going to a voicemail to email system that then people could respond to via the remote desktop. Um, how do people communicate with each other? Uh, we were lucky. We have Office 365 Teams. I can talk more about those functions. Uh, we've been utilizing that, but not everybody had been using them in the office prior. So we had to think about training um, and guidelines. Now, even today, we're, we're thinking about how do we do litigation support, printing, faxing, copying? Um, where does that take place? Who needs equipment? Um, and so I think that the big challenges as we move forward, as I'm going to wrap this up now, is um, the big ones are, one is training in terms of going paperless. A lot of people in our office had different levels of technology. So for the folks that maybe were on the lower spectrum, how do we think about training them and troubleshooting their issues? Um, and also how do we institute some new paperless policies? A lot of our advocates, although they had maybe many e-solutions available over the past couple of years, have stuck with paper solutions. Obviously that doesn't really work in, in this climate. So, you know, what are the different guide, guidance that we can provide for going paperless? Um, and then protecting client security. I will say client data security. That's a big question, right? People are on their personal devices. Um, we have to make sure that people are, although we're in, um, you know, kind of emergency mode that we're still keeping in mind our client data and keeping it secure. And so that's um, something we're still trying to think about ways that we can ensure that happens. But uh, that's it for right now. I'll be on other panels. Um, please reach out to me if you have questions and, and welcome everybody. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Charlie. Um, so as I said, that's sort of a general framing of how we want these conversations to go. So Jenna and I now are going to randomly assign you into breakout groups. And the idea is just to spend 10 minutes talking about what your organization has been doing, what problems you've faced, and sort of the solutions that you've been employing thus far. And to you know, have some actual face-to-face -face conversation and start thinking about what we're gonna do to support each other to move forward in this. Yeah, so we're gonna break you out into groups of nine, around nine people. Um, and then we'll bring you back in about 10 minutes or so to the larger group um, to share back some of the learnings from your conversation. Um, just a logistical note, if you have someone on the phone in your group, 
they will need to press star six to unmute themselves. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and break you Oh, off. and if every group can, uh, before the conversation ends, to choose one person who's going to do the report back for that group, um, who's ready to speak to what that group's conversation was. I have a question. Yes. Um, in past uh, uh, summits, you guys had like a Google Doc or something where everyone could take notes in one place. Do you have that? So right now, actually, we have lot staff uh, who are generously taking notes that will be distributed after the fact. Uh, so thank you, Reet Ann. Uh, we can definitely set up a collaborative note-taking document if that would be useful that I can send out immediately after this. Right now, I have a uh, Google form, a uh, Google Sheet, Google Doc, sorry, um, of the agenda that I can share out to other folks. And then I can also create a collective note-taking document if that would be useful. I will do that while we're doing this breakout groups. All right, thanks. Thanks everyone. You should be invited to join your breakout session. So this might be its own breakout session. Um, can everyone, can anyone on the phone um, unmute themselves just to, did y'all get invitations to go to a certain breakout room? And if you're not hearing anything, um, it's probably because you're on the phone. Um, okay, people are going to their breakout sessions, great. Hi everyone, welcome back to the main, the main group. Um, the breakout rooms are closing um, and they'll be closed in the next 30 seconds and then we'll proceed with the agenda. Hey everyone, welcome back. Um, the chat rooms are closing in the next few seconds and then we'll continue to proceed with the agenda. Thank you for your patience as we try out new technology. All right, it looks like everyone's back. Will someone from um, group, breakout group one um, share back um, their, their conversation? Um, we have about a minute each for each share back. Breakout group one, and you may have to unmute yourself. Um, everyone is automatically muted. Okay, well, we can circle back to group one. If someone from group two wants to share what your group spoke about.
I'm not certain everyone knows which group they're in. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Um, in that case, if we could have the person that each group chose to report back, if you could enter your name into the Zoom chat, we'll do it impromptu stack. Um, while people are doing that, I'm happy to report back from group five as, as people try to remember who self-picked. Because um, we were picking somebody to talk when we got um, shuffled back. Um, our big things is that we were immediately talking about ways to connect with each other in the office because of the, um, um, you know, not being able to, to have that informal connection of what did you do this weekend. Um, so folks recommended Slack is a really great way to connect with teams. Um, but difficult if your organization has an MSFT ecosystem, which Andrew, that is, I don't even understand what that means, but Andrew is a tech person who understands that. Um, Microsoft, maybe? I don't know. Um, somebody will, will correct me. Yeah, and Microsoft. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and folks seem to really love using Zoom. There's, of course, the paid version of Zoom, which if you don't already have Zoom, TechSoup is offering a really good deal on Zoom right now for nonprofits. Um, or you can use, um, for most, most employees can probably get away with it using the free version of Zoom. It's, you need the paid version if you're going to have longer, bigger meetings like this. Um, and then people just recommended connecting with Zoom pretty regularly. And for um, um, like staff morale, like connecting via Zoom and showing pictures of your pets or your food. And then one program was doing a walking Wednesday where they were getting out and doing walks together in some way. So um, yeah, so Jenny said, I heard that Zoom was waiving the 40 minute limit on the free accounts. That's definitely happened to me on happy hours with my friends, but um, I haven't used Zoom, my personal Zoom um, to host a meeting except for happy hours with friends. I don't know if they would if they would waive it if you had like a group of a hundred or something because when we're doing our Zoom meetings are quite large. But yes, when I'm drinking cocktails with my friends, we're able to do that for an hour with no problem. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you, Selena. Um, so Joshua from Group Six, you're on next. Hi, we didn't get through all of our people, but I'll share with you what we were able to talk about. Um, uh, one of our programs was using uh, Google Voice and they added Google Voice numbers um, so that about $20 per month per user, which was cheaper than, you know, getting cell phones out to everyone and allowed people to call and, and text the uh, users without necessarily giving out their personal number. Um, you know, uh, so, uh, some of our programs were still, we aren't on like um, cloud data and so they had to take, you know, data home on hard drives and in, in boxes, uh, uh, physical files, that kind of thing. Um, you know, uh, Rachel uh, from, I forgot which agency, I'm sorry, but this, they set up the Salesforce system and um, uh, they set up a hotline for clients, which is helping them um, communicate with their clients because they were a walk-in clinic and that's, this has been really them and then several of our groups are using um, Office 365, including Teams, um, which can do the chat and the video and the voice. Although um, when it comes to meeting with people outside the organization, you have to jump to something like Zoom or WebEx and things like that. So that's as far as we got. Thank you, Joshua. Yeah, we recognize that we're trying to fit a long okay. very short amount of time. So apologies for that. Um, also, in general, apologies if, if when I call on folks, I butcher your name. Uh, I will do my best, but apologies. Uh, next is Arati from Group 10. Hi, this is Arati. Um, so we kind of talked more about sort of what, what was a big struggle in, in our situations. Um, Microsoft Teams seems to be the Thing that people are using, uh, at least a couple people are using, and uh, getting people to be on the same page with how much they know about Microsoft Teams and being able to troubleshoot is is a bit of a, a problem. Um, there was uh, uh, questions about whether how sustainable some of this is, having all these programs and the licensing. Um, if this is going to go on for a year or so, how how do how is it going to get maintained over the long term? Um, and then there was some discussion, of course, about um, what do you do for people that you really, in general, you want to see them in person or you're supposed to see them in person or you need to have them sign legal papers or meet with them in some way. And so um, one organization was talking about having a room set aside um, and then they have a schedule of, of 
who gets to show up there and have people come by appointment. Um, uh, someone else was also talking about how at this point, because of the facilities, they're not even able to arrange uh, in-person appointments because they're working with uh, detainees um, under immigration. And so the normal process for that is um, gone and they're just trying to uh, see what they can do in terms of phone calls, but that's, um, that's not working as well as one would hope. So that's kind of where we left off. Sorry if I missed something that someone in our group said. Thank you. Um, next is Tania from group seven. Um, yeah, so it's Tanya from We Justice Center. I was with Sharon with um, from One Justice, Chris from Legal Aid Society of San Diego, and then Angelica Herrera uh, from San Diego Volunteer Services. Um, and we got some feedback um, that they've developed policies. Um, they're adjusting to the working from home. Um, folks are checking in with the supervisors daily. Um, we're, um, at least for my myself and one justice, we're trying to assess like the reimbursement policies for folks using their um, internet and cell phone <laughs> uses. Um, we we have a shared comment um, concerned about courts shutting down and how is work going to be shifted as um, uh, the work is limited to what you can do remotely. Um, uh, folks did share that some of the tools that they're using is uh, Google uh, Google uh, G Suite. Um, we're using Teams, um, and uh, someone shared that they were able to successfully meet with um, the clients using these um, tools. Thank you. Next, we have Pablo from Group One. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm one of the right to counsel coordinators at the Eviction Defense Collaborative in San Francisco. And only me and Nikki Brown from the Community Legal Aid SoCal had a chance to report back, but we both were uh, talking that we set up hotlines where uh, people can call in, but we've had trouble, um, you know, getting actual people to call in or knowing how well advertised these hotlines are. We have posters in our doors. So if people come to our office, they'll see the number of the hotline, but obviously not everyone's coming to our doors. There's issues with people um, not having phones, so not being able to access those hotlines. And then Nikki was mentioning how they already had a telecommuting policy in place before the COVID-19 pandemic. So that was really useful um, to, you know, to have that already in place. And how they have a system that allows, to have, that allows them to have their office phone uh, from their smartphone. So this is like a software in, in their phones that has also a texting functionality, which has been very useful when communicating with clients. At EDC, we also have some sort of similar system. It's not for texting, just for um, calling. Um, it's called GoToMeeting, uh, GoToConnect. We've been using that. Obviously, access to printers and printing stuff has been hard, and a lot of uh, clients don't have that access and anywhere to go. Um, and also sometimes keeping track of the court rules um, and what things are being filed or postponed or not postponed um, has also been a little tricky. And in, in the case of San Francisco, you know, some cases are still being filed, but others aren't. Um, and I think that was, I don't know, Nick, if you have anything else you want to add or anyone else from the group one. Um, but that was mostly it, I think. Okay, thank you. Next is Abhijit. Hi, this is Abhijit Chavar. I'm in Los Angeles. Uh, we are we were group nine and uh, we have a Google Doc for us to share. So I'll paste that in the, in the chat here so people can read. read. Um, I won't spend time reading it all out, uh, but what we had was we had um, at least four people that contributed there. Uh, updates um, on what's been happening. So, uh, my audio is not very good. Anyway, here is the document uh, that you can follow along. And um, while I try and fix my audio problems, you can go over the next one. Thank you. Yeah, Zoom and the internet is sometimes a difficult com uh, combination, but we are doing our best. Um, next is Artemisa from Group Four. Um, here we go. Um, we, we ran out of time. I'm sorry. Uh, I think I speak too much, but um, <laughs> what we've 
the few people that spoke, um, remote uh, access um, it was the very was the first uh, priority, and um, we did have challenges with that. And my organization, I am actually from San Diego, Casa Cornelia Law Center, and we did have. Uh, access for a few people for a long time. It's been ongoing for a long time. So we did not anticipate um, problems, but actually we did. <laughs> so we never know, you know, what's gonna happen. Uh, we've been slowly uh, getting remote. Uh, we are on a prior list as to who our um, IT people um, assist. And um, also um, uh, doing crash course on uh, Zoom uh, conferencing. Um, I have um, a training that I had scheduled for months. I actually um, scheduled trainings a year in advance. I did not think it was smart to cancel it. So we went to the Zoom um, platform, um, which is still to happen on Saturday. So, uh, you know, I'm taking notes about this session. Um, so we also had our uh, organization um, uh, sign up for additional Zoom accounts uh, for the, the group accounts. Because last night, um, as I downloaded my Zoom, uh, yes, I noticed that they have that, um, there's a three person limit, 40 minute, I guess, limit on, on the sessions. Um, so in general, remote access has been a challenge and uh, just the learning curve on how to communicate. Our emails have been, um, or other, um, somebody, someone else on the team said that their email inboxes were absolutely jammed. People trying to send notices and let everybody know about what was going on. Uh, we had um, our emails uh, inboxes remain quite manageable. Uh, we ended up with um, um, three type of communication. So um, that has been very manageable, thank goodness. Um, the, the team, uh, the other organization that was challenged with that uh, adopted Slack, and um, he said that it worked really well. So, um, one justice, um, our um, member on the team, um, uh, reported that um, they they don't offer direct services, but um, yeah, they're they're learning new things then as to how to uh, service their constituents. So, I think learning curves are common, and um, just we're all try, trying to get on the, um, trying to work from home has been a, um, definitely challenging. That's all. Thank you. Yes, this is definitely a challenging experience. So we're going to transition to the panel portion to talk briefly about that. We're, we're trying, as with much of this, to figure out ways to take events that we would do in person and turn them into digital things. So the idea of the panel is we hastily assembled some folks to talk about some of the more common issues that people are experiencing. Uh, however, we also recognize there's a lot of knowledge in this uh, digital room right now. So we don't want to limit it just to the folks who contact, contact us in advance. So each panelist is going to speak for a few minutes on what their organization has been doing as solutions for certain issues. But if your organization has also had success or you have a lot of knowledge about an issue, please let us know via Zoom chat to get on stack and we will ask you to speak for a few minutes as to what your organization has been doing. Uh, and that'll be the first portion of each panel and the latter portion will open it up to questions. And for questions, we're gonna ask that if you have a question, just type it in over Zoom chat and either Jenna or I will read it out and ask it to the panelists to preserve time. So to start off, our very first panel, so to speak, is going to be on setting up phone clinics and hotlines. Um, and our first speaker on that is going to be Jora Trang. So I'm gonna pass it over to Jora. Thank you. Um, so I, I literally have two minutes on this, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've heard a lot about what everyone said. Um, so two things I want to bring up in the two minutes I have is multilingual services and language access issues. So um, one thing that's very important is to still be able to serve clients in a way that's, that, that meets their language access needs. And we're dealing with this right now because our online intake form um, is all in English and there's no translation. And so 
in the future, I think we're going to have to engage in some way that's better than just clicking on a translate button, which often isn't isn't always the best. Um, to have multilingual services and also have and to be able to represent not just Spanish speakers but also Vietnamese, Tagalog, you know, uh, multiple languages. Um, the other thing is to have on call, um, if possible, a, a language translation service. There's a couple that are really good and. Um, uh, who are able to, you can call right away, hey, I need a Farsi speaker, and then you can three-way them in. So uh, as a part of the whole telecommuting virtual clinic process, uh, one one part of policy that's very important is to figure out all that, how, how you're gonna engage with multilingual language access issues. The second thing I wanna talk about is ergonomics. So you're all now sitting at home, working at home, and um, your telecommuting um, policies really need to um, include something around how you're sitting at your desk and whatnot, how you're taking breaks, because no one's there to kind of want, you know, you're not in an office setting. And so it's more loose. Um, and so we want to make sure that people remain safe and healthy in their home. WorkSafe can definitely help with that because we're, uh, you're, we're your statewide uh, occupational health and safety expert. But um, we need we need to really be uh, mindful of the proper sitting position because the last thing we want is everyone to come back in two months and and you're having pain around your wrist you're having pain you know just in your your back and your sitting position so um offices should be able to uh, assist with uh, purchasing ergonomic kind of things that are necessary for example i need to stand a lot so i have a standing desk at home with a standing mat and a very special keyboard for carpal tunnel issues um, so keep those in mind um, as you're formulating your work at home policies. My two minutes should be up, right? <laughs> Just about. Thank you so much, Dara. Um, sure. Next is going to be Autumn Elliott. Hi, this is Autumn from um, Disability Rights California, and I wanted to address um, disability access um, since we are all covered by Title III of the ADA, um, comparable state laws, and um, a whole bunch of other laws that um, basically say anything that we do needs to be accessible for people with disabilities. And in this context, that mostly means um, Number one, we need to make sure we're providing effective communication for people with sensory disabilities, and two, that um, people can still get reasonable accommodations if they need it. Um, so for example, um, effective communication for people with sensory disabilities means um, if, if you are blind, if you're deaf, um, you can still access services. So for example, if, um, people are going to have the ability to make telephone appointments online, then your website itself has to be accessible for somebody who's using um, technology, assistive technology to access your website. Um, if you're making publications online, um, the documents that people download have to be accessible for people who use that technology. Um, if you're doing videos, um, that you're posting online, they need they need captioning for people who are deaf. Um, people who answer the phone should be trained on what to expect if a um, deaf person is using a video relay service um, to make the call, um, which is something that is mostly replacing the TTY machines that your organization probably still has but hardly ever uses. Um, also, it's important to recognize that for some people with disabilities, phone calls just aren't going to work as well, um, and you'll want to have a plan for what are you going to do in a situation like that. Um, the other part is reasonable accommodations. Um, to the extent that folks are coming up with a new system for doing clinics or um, telephone intakes or interviews, um, make sure that whatever system that gets designed isn't so rigid that you can't meet people's needs. So for example, if due to a disability, somebody can't focus in the morning and needs an afternoon call, um, you need a system that's not so rigid that people have to have whatever appointment they get assigned and can't change that. 
Um, at DRC, we're still providing regular DRC intake services. Um, our phone line's still up. We have an online application. Um, and if people need an accommodation, they can either request that on the phone or on our web intake form. And we work with them individually to provide that. And the last thing I'll say is to the extent that folks are purchasing new te um, technology to either um, relate to clients or to let staff members work remotely, it's really important to make sure that that technology is accessible to people with disabilities. And if you just ask, is it accessible, they will always say yes, and it probably isn't. Um, so you've got to push that. Um, for example, we re, um, last fall bought some new technology and because we kind of pushed them on the disability access issue, the company actually hired a web, like an internet access expert to assess what they were doing and um, realized that they actually had some problems and came up with a plan to fix it. Thank you so much, Autumn. Um, yeah, I think we might have mentioned earlier, but after the event, Jenna and I, along with the notes, will be sending out resources to everyone, uh, including resources on accessibility and then also things on translation uh, from what folks are saying. Those are both definitely super important considerations when we're putting together remote client services. Um, so there's no one else on stack for hotline or phone uh, services specifically. So we are going to transition to broader virtual clinics uh, and sort of thinking outside of the phones about ways to meet with and serve clients. So I'm actually going to pass it back off again to Jora um, to speak a little bit more on that. Oh, sorry. Uh, services to our clients? Is that what we're on right now? Yeah, so thinking of beyond just phones, but other like virtual clinics and other sort of digital ways to communicate and uh, serve clients. Okay. Sorry, I didn't know I had more than two minutes. <laughs> uh, so, um, other ways to um, engage with clients beyond virtual clinics. Um, so one thing that we're doing, um, it's a real, it's a particularly uh, vulnerable time for workers like day laborers, domestic workers and whatnot, who, um, you know, there's a general uh, assumption that people have smartphones or, or, ca or web cameras and all this kind of technology to be able to uh, phone in and dial in. And that's particularly difficult for folks who depend on a daily basis um, on work such as day laborers and domestic workers and who are not able to engage in those kind of services. And so we're currently working and talking to worker centers about setting up um, some kind of like in in service um, or in line in pre, in present um, legal clinic that's connected to the 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 resources that they're giving out. So uh, many centers or it's actually community centers are giving out food and and other uh, items of necessity. Um, and and, and uh, what we're thinking about doing is setting up a virtual kind of like Google Hangout Skype room like this, like what we're doing, except it's just kind of going to be there. And someone can come and sit when they're receiving their goods, their medical care, whatever those necessary things that they have to get while at the same time getting those services um, from us, the legal services provider. The problem with that is that you're still kind of theoretically, technically violating the call to, for, for non, you know, non-engagement. So it's kind of tricky. We got to work around it somehow. And so we're still, we're still kind of ironing out the kinks of that. Um, but that's one idea of how to um, continue to engage, like having office hours of some sort, some way with a community center. Okay, thank you again, Jora. Um, so we're going to open it up for questions about phone clinics, providing services digitally. So if you have uh, questions, feel free to put them in the chat over Zoom and Jenna and I will read them out and ask both Autumn and Jora. And also, again, as uh, Jenna just said over chat, like there's a lot of knowledge in this uh, digital meeting right now. Uh, I know you folks are also working on these issues and I'm sure have some extra insight and solutions to share. So if you would like to speak on that, please also let us know over chat and I'm happy to pass it over to you to speak for a few minutes. Um, but we do have one question. So 
What about people who don't have access to a laptop, computer, et cetera? How do we let them know that there are clinics available over the phone? So I'm gonna pass that off to Jordan and Adam, and then if there are other people who have additional answers, let us know over the chat. So either Jora or Autumn, if you have a direct answer to that, feel free to unmute yourself and respond. Yeah, so I was trying to unmute myself um, while eating an almond. Um, so <laughs> um, I, I just mentioned this. I, I think um, we're going to try to coordinate with our community services um, partners. I think now is, the, is a really good time to really engage your partnerships out there. Um, as legal services provider um, and support centers, um, we often ally with people to get them to you know sign on support letters or whatnot but now is a really great time to really talk about hey what what kind of virtual clinics can we set up with you and how and and through the process of engaging with them you can make um it known um that you have these clinics uh through community services like if they're if they're making it known that they're passing out food toilet paper or whatever um hopefully you can also engage them in in making sure that your virtual clinic is also advertised during that process um, there are also community media that's going on right now. Um, I live in the Fruitvale, which is East Oakland, um, which is a, a extremely diverse community, um, but primarily Latino. And there are um, there are ways that the community is engaging with each, with each other through radio, through um, different different means of communicating. So tap into that, whatever that may be for your community, and figure out how to get that those um, that information out, not virtually uh, like on the internet, but through radio. Word of mouth. Flyer. Um, this is Autumn. I, I think um, that's absolutely right. And would add that when folks reach out to community organizations um, to make sure that those include organizations of um, and for people with disabilities. Um, for example, throughout the state, there are independent living centers, um, which are sort of before and by people with disabilities um, and typically have a good connection with um, the local community. Thank you both. Um, Kathy also is willing to speak briefly on virtual clinics. I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy. You are still available to talk briefly about what your organization is doing to set up virtual clinics. Hi, um, I'm Kathy Cobert with Legal Services of Northern California, and I actually work in the Reading office. And we've been very short staffed this year. And so one of the things we started was a virtual uh, tenants rights clinic. We do have, we serve five Northern California counties from our office. And so we do a Google Hangout and we actually have Ollie, who is a managing attorney in our Solano office, do the presentation for us. We have people in our clinic room and then we have people calling from all over, either calling in or using their computer to get involved in the clinic. And um, it seems to be working really well. It's, it's been a way that we could serve more clients and um, <clears throat> meet their needs and then determine whether they need to have more service than the clinic gives them or if they can just you know get that information and and then their questions are answered thank you kathy uh, another question that someone posed is is there a way state support centers can assist with some of the lsp hurdles seems like a broader question beyond just a uh, virtual or phone clinics, so maybe we can circle back to that unless someone feels uh, eager to answer it immediately. Um, another one is a question about signatures, uh, about asking how folks who are running virtual and phone clinics are managing signatures and documents in general. And it seems like there's the beginning of an answer in the chat, but I'd also like to open it up to folks to respond to it verbally. So if any of the people who spoke uh, briefly about the organizations want to field that answer, um, feel free to unmute yourself and talk a bit about how you're handling signatures. Hey. Hi, this is Yin Wen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I am from Community Legal Services here in East Palo Alto in the Bay Area. Um, we have 
a lot of clients who need signatures and if they have email we send the documents through email since um, a lot of the processes are for USCIS and they are now accepting wet signatures um, so we're doing that through email if they don't have email we do send them the documents and then they can send back to us we're trying to come up with a better um, solution I guess for this since it is a lot of back and forth so if any of you have any ideas on how we can better do this um, I would be very happy to hear um, your ideas hey this is Charlie um, we're using Laya for our e-sign um, it's worked pretty well they have instructions pre-made instructions you can send to staff about how to create kind of an e-sign package and then send it to a client clear that only works for clients that have access to a computer or they can do it on their phone um, which which uh, folks do um, we also it depends on the county but certain courts for instance are allowing for verbal um, acknowledgement of an e-signature so if the organization is signing on behalf of certain UD uh, clients um, so we added a tech a box basically to legal server confirming that um, you know they kind of gone through the required um, uh, you know acknowledgement that they were read what the contents of the document etc so we figured out kind of had a way to record that and then sign on behalf of only for certain cases and please you know look to your court websites to confirm that that is allowable but um, LSC also has guidance for those LSC organizations that we use to kind of base our e-sign policy which um, if you don't have I'm happy to send out oh there's a follow-up question for you Charlie of is that allowable in LA uh, for certain UD situations right now yes Thank you. And then I think there was a follow up as well to the idea of, uh, of sending, I think it was what Yunan was speaking to, or how do you send those to clients? Wait, is that for, is that for me? Sorry. It was to um, Yunan, and you were speaking about um, how USCIS is uh, allowing for wet signatures. I think the question is about, I guess, communicating that with clients. Is unclear. If you wrote that question and uh, could clarify slightly as to what you what you're asking, uh, we will circle back to it. Oh, already answered. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Moving forward. Um, so the next, unless there is anyone else who wants to speak to specifically virtual clinics or phone clinics and hotlines, we're going to move to the related issue of how folks are doing intake procedures, uh, whether that's cloud-based, phone-based. Uh, specifically thinking about cloud-based intake of trying to use the internet to connect folks to services. Um, Jura, I know you also said you're willing to speak to this. I know I've been asking you to speak a lot, so uh, if you're able to speak to it, that would be wonderful. And if not, we can ask the general audience about what your organization has been doing for cloud-based intake. Um, in terms of cloud-based intake, I think I talked about this in the very first um, discussion is that uh, well I've, I've, I've had experience running a hotline before and also WorkSafe is currently doing intakes through our um, our online um, web web complaint form um, but the intake process depending on how many intake calls you expect um, can be either very simple or extremely uh, extremely complicated so if you're expecting a lot of hotline calls uh, you really need a system that um, immediately gives clients um, any language access needs up front or any other ability needs up front as well and they have options and choices for those um, uh, in terms of cloud-based what we do is our, our current web-based form feeds right into a google spreadsheet which then we've assigned to somebody um, to uh, monitor so that nothing uh, kind of gets lost and I feel like I might be preaching to the choir in the sense that many many of you might have this already but um, it's really important especially now when you don't have the, the luxury of just kind of running down the office and, and talking to your colleague to really have an online uh, TA uh, what we call technical assist or intake um, uh, form that is easily accessible by everyone can be checked on by everyone and that you have actually scheduled check-ins where you're you're monitoring all the intakes and who's doing what and where. 
Thank you. Is there, if there are any questions about cloud-based intake, uh, what programs organizations are using, please let us know uh, via the chat. Um, and then depending, if it's useful, I might send out some sort of form based off what programs people are using, like a quick impromptu survey for after this event so we can get information about what every organization is using for their technical solutions that I can also send out to the larger audience. Because it sounds like, yeah, lots of folks already have systems in place, but for people who are considering building new ones, it could be useful to know what other organizations are using. Okay, so it looks like there are no further follow-up questions around cloud-based intake. Uh, if there are and they come up later, just send it via, to us via Zoom chat and we can get back to it. But the next topic we wanted to check in about is a little bit of a transition, thinking more broadly in terms of working remotely, what sort of technology different organizations have been using to support this transition and that process. Um, so to start off, I'm gonna ask Abhijit, again, to speak to a bit about what his organization has been doing. Um, I don't think your audio is on. You're not muted, but perhaps something with the microphone. Um, we can see your face, but we can't hear you. This is the reality of, of Zoom. Hello. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Better? OK. Um, let me share my screen here. Um, let me see if, how I can do that. Share screen. OK, so I have a quick um, uh, slight presentation I was putting together on some general tips that I've learned uh, over the last uh, few uh, days. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay, so uh, uh, some quick things. I uh, go to meeting, mute keyboard shortcut is control alt a on Windows and there's a link to find that on, on, on Macintosh too. And uh, there's a, on, on Zoom, it's alt a and I've been trying to train myself to use that uh, like a ninja. Uh, so keyboard shortcuts are a good way to learn how to uh, navigate these new web conference tools we have to use. Here's another one. This is called a web conference flashcard. And basically what this is, is if you're on a, a, a video call like this and you're muted and you want to, um, to communicate something if in a group call, uh, you can just say, uh, you know, I'd like to speak. Uh, like that, it just shows up. So you can um, uh, you can uh, use this on your phone. You can pull it up on your phone and hold it up to the screen, and uh, and people can see uh, what you're saying. Uh, so this is just a quick uh, hack here to um, to uh, use in web conferencing. Uh, here are a couple of articles I read recently encouraging participation in virtual meetings. Uh, so this is how, when we have virtual meetings. It's hard, especially large ones. It's hard to get to, uh, to get people engaged. So here are some tips from the Harvard Business Review. And then there is something new that we've just discovered, something called Zoom bombing. If your Zoom link is public, people can crash into your Zoom uh, meeting. So here is a, a, a post from Zoom on how to prevent that from happening. Essentially, it means creating unique meeting uh, URLs, links, so that people uh, can't just take a common one and, and jump into your Zoom meeting. So these are, um, these are links you can use. Uh, I will make these slides available for everyone uh, and I'll add to it as more information comes, comes my way. Uh, just so you know, in our legal services community, there are a few crowdsourced initiatives that have emerged. Uh, Vanderbilt Law has put together a list of uh, legal innovators. And um, if you, if you, if you are somebody innovating in the legal field, you might want to go and fill out that form and uh, Professor Kat Moon uh, will add you to that list. Um, so I'll add her um, Twitter handle in here too so you can follow her. But that's a list of legal innovators that you could follow to see what's happening now as our community tries to respond to this new need. Uh, Cali, which does offer online legal education, has put together a list of expert guest speakers. 
um, and these are people who are willing to speak and these are meant for law schools but if you if you need to tap into that expertise uh, you might want to go take a look at that li uh, list also suffolk um, uh, uh, legal innovation and technology lab has put together a crowdsource initiative called document assembly line this is to build document assembly um, uh, online interviews uh, using an open source um, software called DocAssemble. Uh, if you can contribute to this initiative, I encourage you to check it out. Uh, and certainly you may want to tap into whatever um, is generated from this initiative and use it in your own situation. Uh, another uh, document that, uh, another tool that you might want to use is one I had, I had built uh, several years ago, it's called Guide Clearly. It is now operated by Pine Tree Legal Aid, and it allows you to quickly build question and answer guides. Uh, you do not require uh, coding. And there's a demo there that I'm, I put a link in there for you to go check out. It shows you how you can build a small little um, question answer interactive um, uh, widget that you can put on your website. Uh, this is used for sort of building uh, frequently asked questions or guiding people to the right resource uh, via question and answers or, or building screeners um, for services like, like Pine Tree Legal did for like a triage type of situation. So that's all I have for now. I will add to this deck as more information comes along and I'll, I'll share this link with you. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much for that impromptu presentation. That was fantastic. Um, and we will make sure that that presentation and the resources in it get sent out along with all of the notes and other resources after the summit. Um, so next also to talk about working remotely is uh, Joshua Long. Hi, um, so I mean, I think a lot of the stuff I was gonna say has been mentioned already. People have talked about Zoom and Microsoft Teams. Um, one of the things that we did is we uh, gave people, our people, um, like these little Wi-Fi dongles so they could take their voice over IP phone home and connect via their home uh, Wi-Fi network. That was really helpful. So we can transfer calls to each other as if, you know, our, 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 our front desk is still open. Um, uh, but I, maybe I'll use the last minute and a half that I have to say something that I've observed in our own organization which is that um, uh, we have a lot of these technology initiatives that our, our IT people and some of our administrative departments have trying to push for a while. And usually when it's day-to-day -day operation with SANS pandemic, it's very hard to get some of these initiatives put through. But I'll tell you, I've got people begging me for initiatives that they were resistant to for months and months and months and even years, but now they're like, get us e-faxing now, get us electronic uh, document signing now, uh, get us the um, uh, ability to, uh, I forgot what the third one is. Oh, um, uh, anyway, but the, there's a lot of these initiatives that we're, we're trying to put, we were trying to put through. And now all of a sudden with this distancing, it is a great opportunity for us to leap forward um, uh, past a lot of uh, challenges that we had in terms of change management and a cultural change in the organization. Right now, people are like, please give us change because we got to get, we need it to get our work done. And so I think that a lot of the initiatives that we're going to be um, putting out there now are ones that we will not go back on once we go back to uh, working in the office. We will hold on to hopefully electronic uh, signatures so that um, you know, our clients don't have to drive into the office to sign a, a, a client attestation or, a, you know, an extended service agreement. And so I'm really excited about things where it's helping us change the culture to um, no longer, we, we, we relied a lot on walk-ins and, um, and now people are more open to telephone intake. And I think that that's, that's actually really good for us. So, um, you know, other than uh, uh, that, I think people have covered most of the technical stuff that I was going to mention. Um, I'm with California Rural Legal Assistance, and if you guys have questions about the technical side of things, I have, um, uh, it, we're set up fairly well. We're using Office 365. We, we don't just upload our documents into the cloud when we want to share them. We just keep everything in the cloud, and that has made things very, very helpful. It means that 
when somebody's computer dies, we just send them an empty one and they hit sync and they have all their documents back again. It allows them to work from home without, you know, saying, wait, I forgot something at the office. So that there's a lot of, there's a lot of great um, uh, uh, benefit to moving completely into the cloud for, for uh, a lot of your services. So please talk to us if, if uh, you need help or advice on anything, uh, we're available. That's all I have. Thank you, Joshua. So next on stack is Charlie. Well, you just made me very jealous, Josh, uh, <laughs> because I remember at the LSC TIG conference this year, there was a presentation about migrating docs to OneDrive, and I was like, yeah, we'll get to that sometime. Man, I wish we had done that because, um, and that's what I'm gonna talk about is our sort of solution that isn't OneDrive. I mean, that would make sense, and I think we should look into getting everything on OneDrive ASAP. The challenge that we faced was our remote desktop was only built to help to manage about 25 to 40 people at any time. So we simply, when this just turned on all of a sudden, did not have the capacity. And as many of you tech people probably know, there were no options to buy additional servers. So we had to come up with a solution out of thin air, basically, that could allow our advocates to access their files and also conduct their work securely. We're using TeamViewer. I don't know if anybody else has this issue um, or um, uh, you know, is looking for a solution. It's worked well for us so far, basically creates a, a, a remote access to the individual's desktop themselves, um, which creates issues in terms of making sure their computers are on, et cetera, and it has to be set up on all their personal devices, and that's been a logistical nightmare. But we got there and it's been working. I'm happy to share those experiences um, with folks. But I would also say just Josh has a way better idea, which is using OneDrive. And we're at Office 365, so we have no real, real excuse not to be doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so as I said in uh, the chat, the, if people want to speak to how their own office is adapting to work remotely, please let us know and I will call on you. In the meantime, we have questions. So for those folks who just spoke, this seems like a broader question, but um, perhaps you'll have some insight into it. Of, is there something we can do to make sure clients have access to a computer, specifically rural people? So if anyone who either spoke or in the larger audience is able to speak to a larger issue of computer access for folks, uh, that would be wonderful. Mm, how to solve the digital divide. Um, that's, that's a big, big question. I, I think um, one of the things that a lot of these technologies that are emerging rely on is the fact that a lot of our clients are going to skip right over having a desktop computer and go straight to having a, a smartphone. Um, and so I think the smartphone, usually having a camera and a microphone built in is what a lot of these technologies are counting on that, um, you know, that our, our, our clients will get those and be able to receive email on their phone without ever needing to really own a desktop computer. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I feel like the smartphone uh, a wave is kind of helping us close that divide a little bit. Uh, may I address that? Okay. Um, our client base is um, definitely have no, they have no access to uh, desktop computers, but they all somehow manage to have a telephone. And so um, how, what we found out um, several years ago was that um, they were able to text a lot easier than even receive calls because of the type of jobs that they were, they were doing in the service industries. So we've, uh, we had already adopted uh, texting and we have to go back to um, what is the most common uh, denominator in, among our, our client base. And um, so we were able to um, confirm appointments uh, with our attorneys or with our volunteer attorneys, uh, remind them, um, um, remind them of documents they hadn't turned in. You know, so we conducted a lot of the business that way. So right now, we have not experienced any actually too much of a degradation in our current client uh, support. Um, and then uh, last year, no, a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago probably, um, I decided to bring all the volunteers also into the texting world 
because we were trying to communicate via email because we would have communications recorded that way, right? But um, it was difficult to get where I'm trying, let's say I'm trying to set up an interpretation within the next, you know, that's happening within the next 12 hours and um, texting seemed to be faster. So we were already there. So as it turns out, then um, the telephone, the, the, the uh, smart telephones have, have been lifesaver and allowed us a business continuity in this, in, at this time. Thank you both for speaking to that. It's definitely a moment that highlights the digital divide in the Starford terms than ever before. Yes. Um, so if there are, there are no other questions right now for working remotely, but if there are the ones that come up in the future, again, just let us know over Zoom chat and we can always circle back. We're going to transition to a new topic, which is thinking about connecting with pro bono attorneys and how technology is being used to foster those connections. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Jay Lee to talk a bit about that. Hi, uh, this is uh, Jay Lee. I'm the pro bono manager for the Justice and Diversity Center, which is affiliated with the Bar Association of San Francisco. Um, and my pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, I just wanted to talk to you uh, sort of about three challenges uh, in terms of dealing with pro bono attorneys, uh, three touch points, if you will. Um, uh, in terms of outreach and placement of pro bono matters, uh, we find that especially right now there is a huge demand for legal assistance as well as a supply and to sort of reduce some of the barriers barriers associated with connecting our pro bono uh, volunteers with our clients two i want to talk about training um, where historically we found in-person trainings to be much more effective than online trainings not only because it allows the um, volunteers to develop a personal connection to the supervising attorney but it also is a two-way communication and a two-way vetting process where we can get a better sense of the suitability of that volunteer uh, based on an in-person meeting uh, as opposed to a phone call or even an online uh, uh, video chat. And then lastly, um, in terms of uh, quality control. Um, uh, so JDC offers uh, both uh, limited scope uh, clinics as well as full scope pro bono placements. And we found that uh, for limited scope clinics, uh, it's always very helpful to have uh, supervising attorneys and other mentors there to provide guidance. Um, and even in terms of the full scope placements, uh, it's always very helpful to have a warm handoff to the client as well. So those are the three sort of big buckets of in terms of challenges that we're encountering, uh, basically uh, using a re uh, remote or work from home uh, solution. And you know, we don't really have a good solution for any of these uh, problems, but what we've been trying to do is with regard to outreach and placement, um, historically in terms of placing pro bono matters, we've been sort of old school and using email blasts to get the information out there. There are of course other platforms that are being developed like Paladin and uh, We The People. Um, so we're looking at those uh, solutions as well, but at the moment um, because of the sort of um, sort of combined sort of high need for legal uh, pro bono placements, as well as I think temporarily uh, sort of high supply of volunteer attorneys who want to help. Um, we want to sort of try to streamline that placement process, including the, uh, uh, the conflicts check process as much as possible. And so we're relying on a Google Doc approach where we provide live updates in terms of the cases needing placement and their status on a Google Doc that people who are given the link uh, can check at any time when they are available. And to the extent that uh, they're willing to take on a matter, um, we actually also um, have a system where we can send them a secondary link to provide all the conflicts information through Google Docs as well. So it really sort of cuts down on the time in terms of any sort of lag in correspondence or communications in terms of emails to the extent that you know, we have to wait overnight to send them conflicts check information and things like that. So um, we're using the sort of um, uh, Google Docs sort of format to sort of try to cut down on that and streamline the placement process, process as much as possible. Uh, with regard to training, um, so of course this is a new paradigm for everyone, and so we're looking at ways of 
um, delivering uh, two-way communication trainings that allow us to, as I said, um, maintain that sort of vetting sort of function of the in-person trainings, as well as developing that personal connection with the volunteer trainee so that they are more likely to take on a case after the training. So Zoom is sort of, I think, the default method that we're doing this, but to the extent that folks have other solutions for this, I, I'm all ears. Um, and then finally, in terms of quality control, um, especially when it comes to clinics, we find that it's really important that, um, you know, even though a lot of our pro bono volunteers have a lot of experience, it's really critical to have a supervising attorney there, not only to answer questions, but also, also just to sort of check in and sort of make sure that everyone is um, on the same page as to what kinds and uh, sort of scope of the legal assistance that's being delivered. And um, again, this is not a sort of area where we have a ready-made solution, but um, because when we move to a vir virtual clinic model, uh, we basically move to basically a phone conference model, a, tel a teleconference model. Um, so we've been sort of adding uh, the Slack sort of, um, uh, sort of infrastructure on top of the, the teleconference model so that um, volunteer attorneys can continue on a live basis to communicate with the supervising attorney uh, to the extent that any questions come up or, uh, and that also allows the supervising attorney to sort of check in with all the different volunteers um, to make sure that everyone's on the same page as to what they should be doing. Uh, and lastly, in terms of the warm handoff, that's another area that like, I'm really curious as to how folks are sort of addressing this challenge of not being able to have in-person meetings. Um, you know, we're kind of using conference calls as a very poor imitation of the original in-person warm handoffs that we find very effective. Um, and I was actually really intrigued by uh, one of the uh, previous panelists who had talked about having like a clean room or a sanitized room where folks are continuing to meet in person. Um, that's, that's an interesting solution and I'd just love to hear more from folks as to how they're addressing that particular challenge as well. Thank you, Jay. Um, yeah, we can definitely circle back to people considering broader solutions uh, of how to interact and connect with clients and other folks. Um, but to continue talking about pro bono attorneys and connecting and coordinating with them, next is uh, Sharon Bashan. Hi, um, this is Sharon Bashan from One Justice. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, for those of you who don't know us, One Justice is a statewide support center that works with your organizations to help build your capacity to meet the legal needs of uh, your local communities. And one way we do that through is through our pro bono innovation lab, um, where we expand uh, legal services for Californians in need by developing and staffing innovative and effective pro bono projects with your organizations, law schools, and law firms around the state. Um, we are knee deep in COVID-19 response for the sector right now. And I'll tell you some of our thinking so far. So with regards to pro bono, we're looking at a few pieces. One is how we can build an effective resource guide. Who is doing what? And um, how does everyone have access to those opportunities? And what platforms are best to use um, to best share this out? Um, so for example, like Square has a calendar function. Would it make sense to um, have the sector post their um, virtual pro bono opportunities clinics? Who has access to this? Would firms have access? And would it be a way to connect everyone and to bring needs and resources together? And like anything else, um, these systems are only as good as um, the people that use them and how often it gets updated. So the last thing we want to do is put all of our resources into creating some kind of um, live resource guide and then not have people update it and then it becomes stale and we lose the integrity of that. So we're thinking through those pieces. We also know that APCO is compiling some of that information for, um, for their own efforts. So um, collaborating with them as well. Um, the second piece is just looking at pro bono clinic design, which includes virtual technology. I know that most of um, your organizations have done virtual clinics in the past to some extent. 
this is a new situation and that everyone would be virtual. Um, it's not a model where, where we can have clients walk into a library to access a computer. So access to tech to clients is key. And can we use, as previous um, panelists said, like um, smartphones to um, have apps where clients can access pro bono attorneys who then have access to supervision from legal, legal aid organizations in an effective and efficient manner. Um, and then of course, the document sharing piece, um, using LIA or other platforms to share documents, um, how do you get wet signatures? And I think Charlie addressed that pretty well. Um, another thing that we are thinking about and we're already um, involved in is just doing convenings to support your organizations. We've um, already been setting up extra pro bono manager groups regionally to discuss what some of your pro bono needs are and then like sharing out that information. One thing to think about is um, how we can best support you. So feel free to email me. Um, and a question for you is, with a multitude of COVID calls that we're on every single day, do we need to set up more convenings? Um, and if so, what would that look like and how would these be unique to the other calls that you're on? Um, so opening that up. Um, Jay mentioned training and training for pro bono. One thing that some of our partners have used is our um, Pro Bono Training Institute um, website. It is free to all of your organizations. There is a whole host of um, poverty law trainings for pro bono attorneys. And what some organizations have done so that they don't lose those valuable touch points is that they've let their pro bono attorneys watch that and it's set up in modules, bite-sized modules, and then they've tacked on um, sort of a live piece so that they can uh, further refine the trainings, give like pointers for their own practices, their own jurisdictions, local rules, and still like retain that um, touch point with their pro bono attorneys. So I'm just gonna um, leave that out as a resource that I would encourage all of your organizations to tap into. Uh, that's about it for now. Thank you, Sharon. Um, so if, are there any questions from the audience as to coordination with pro bono attorneys, anything you'd like addressed or are curious about so what was just um, spoken about? If so, let us know over Zoom chat. I don't see any questions yet. Oh, I do have a question. Um, Sharon, could you repeat the resource that you just mentioned? It is the Pro Bono Training Institute. You can Google that and it'll take us to the page. Okay, thank you. Um, so the very last panel topic that we had for today uh, was thinking about coordinating advocacy remotely and what different organizations are doing to continue their advocacy efforts now that we can no longer meet in person and how that might impact advocacy and how technology can be used to ease that transition. So if there are people who are willing to speak on that as usual, please let us know over the Zoom chat. Otherwise, Jora, I know you also, Mark, that you'd be interested to speak to that. Um, so if you are willing, feel free to take it away. If not, we can coordinate with other folks. Um, sure. Um, so I, I, I feel like we all have been doing this. Um, coalition efforts are really um, vital right now, um, especially because um, for those of us who are working on workers' rights, um, there's been just an onslaught of workers um, being laid off uh, or fired, or um, we've experienced workers being forced to go to work um, despite the um, the uh, the non um, the rule the, the law basically um, or the rule that's been set out um, and so that that has been very challenging to be able to provide like advocacy efforts in this kind of environment where we're basically getting hit with like hundreds of calls every day from workers who are experiencing issues um, and so solidarity efforts and coalition efforts are really vital during this period um, so that we can leverage all of our partners um, uh, virtual clinics or uh, the different various uh, tools that we're all using and also so that we're all not doing the same exact thing and so one thing I noticed within a week of um, 
of Alameda County being shut down and California being shut down subsequent to that is that all of our partners issue the same exact or not same exact, but very, virtually very similar um, demands on the government on what to do. And so we're all kind of spinning our own wheels, doing the same exact thing. And so, for example, one thing that I'm do we're doing this uh, today is WorkSafe is um, convening a statewide uh, call with all advocates who work with workers um, to, to try to all get on the same page with respect to our um, our, our messaging, but also as a result of that, hopefully also um, coming together to say, what are you guys doing? Where are the gaps? And how can how can we work together to fill in the gaps? Um, and and whether we do that virtually or not is going to be a part of the discussion. And so, this this tech summit is actually the beginning process of this, and it would be interesting to actually have a. Um, a follow-up to this because I don't have the answers yet until after I meet today. <laughs> um, um, so uh, those are some things that WorkSafe is, is doing in coalition efforts. Um, this is Selena from LAC and you know, Jory, you mentioned that this is kind of a, one of the steps, if not the first step, it's, you know, second or third or fourth. One thing that LAC is really committed to doing is um, if there are topics that come up here that feel like they need further discussion, whether it's a, a separate 15 minute or 30 minute Zoom meeting, we are happy to do follow ups um, because we have the Zoom Pro account. So it's very easy for us to pop it, pop it up and record it. And if folks want to have a conversation that's not recorded, we can you know make sure it's not recorded. it. Um, but yeah, I think that that the one thing that I've noticed that I think Jenna referenced in the welcome was just that they're really amazing regional groups that are working together. But what I've struggled with at LAC is making sure that everybody feels plugged in. Um, and we want to try to create a place where if you are somebody who works with workers and for some reason you don't know about WorkSafe, like how do they know to reach out to you for the next convening? Um, and I think we've had a lot of leadership turnover in the past few years, especially um, just in the, in the legal aid world, change of executive director and senior management. So making sure that the new folks feel plugged in and that they know where to go, um, whether it's a support center or whether it's just a person who's especially well connected. So if folks have resources and listservs and pop up Slack channels, um, let Theo or Jenna know because we are trying to compile that. Thank you, Selena. Yeah, we'll be sending out the existing listservs that we're aware of after in the follow-up information, but if there are new convenings or things that spring up, please, please let us know and we will distribute them to all attendees. Um, and I see Theo asked me, um, they asked if I wanted to add anything around advocacy. Um, I think all of you who do any legislative advocacy or budget advocacy, um, you know, the legislature is, um, you know, shut down for now. They're on recess. They'll be coming back um, at some point, hopefully in April. But I think for all of us to do any advocacy, it's about maintaining connections with our legislative staff friends so that when they do come back in session, if we had a priority issue we were working on, um, helping to make sure that it just doesn't die in this, in this session because of COVID-19 um, resources and interest. So it's just been a challenge for, um, for a lot of us is we have friends who are still working. Um, and then just reaching out to them by phone or email or text to say, hey, as soon as you're back, let me know. I'm happy to do more of the work than I, than I usually would have done to help tee up an issue. Um, and then making sure the advocates feel connected with each other. I think that I also feel like in our office, so much of our advocacy and our policy work and connecting um, various um, programs within LAC is just the, the constant meeting in person. So that's, that's been a struggle for us is making sure that we don't um, re-silo ourselves after working so hard to break open the silos and lack of the various areas that are very connected now. So that's going to be an ongoing struggle. Thank you, Selena. So we're running a bit early as far as panels go. This was our established content. We also recognize like there are lots of different issues. We also threw a whole bunch of content at folks very, very quickly. So if there are things people want discussed further, if there are questions that maybe didn't fit into any of the earlier subjects that people wanted addressed or things that you were hoping to get out of this event that so far you haven't gotten, um, please let us know via chat now and we can hopefully coordinate speakers or ask folks to speak to those issues. So open call for if people have questions or requests for which are coming in. Um, I have a question, I think this is probably for you, Selena, it's the LAC related question, but is LAC following all the measures addressed here with a view toward the long-term effects it will have on structure, organization, and operations? For example, remote communication with outlying slash distant parts of our service areas. 
some of it, although I have to say there's so much information coming at me now. Um, sometimes I'm trying to figure out, is this something that LAC can do? Is it something that someone else is already doing? So I, I like to support the efforts that are already ongoing. I've heard several folks just in the past couple of weeks talk about um, specifically e-filing and you know, a lot of the urban courts already have e-filing in place, but a lot of the rural courts do not. And so now um, if you're practicing in a rural area and you're trying to file, you know, a TRO via um, e-filing, um, it's just, it's much harder in, in a way that if technology had been figured out a year ago, it wouldn't be harder. So I've been trying to look at issues around, um, around the judicial council, talking with folks over there around, um, I know what, some of you have told me that if you're trying to do e-service, whether you have effective service electronically by email, um, it's clear that you've served the other party, but then the other party is demanding service by mail, which is hard if your attorneys are working from home and, and you know, hard to print out all the copies and, and get them mailed. So we're trying to figure out if there's a, a statewide policy issue around um, you know, especially around an emergency, if you, if the service actually happened by email, um, can you make sure that opposing counsel doesn't demand it by mail? So if, if you feel like there's policy issues, definitely let me know because I'm trying to talk with judicial counsel about this. Um, but I'm hoping that, that um, this is just raising issues that uh, presiding judges in the more rural and remote courts can start to take these issues seriously and um, how they can roll out um, you know, voluntary e-filing and, and other processes that should have happened already. So it does look like we have another tech-focused question that someone's put forward about asking about how can you use tech tools to contact and communicate with clients over the phone without revealing your personal cell phone uh, and what sort of technological solutions there are for preserving your private information and phone number. So someone is able to speak to tools that they know of or have used Please feel free to unmute yourself. I, I can say two things. Um, this is Josh from CRLA. I, uh, so we, um, uh, uh, for instance, like if, you, if you're stuck at home and you don't have your voice over IP desk phone at home and you have to use your personal phone number, uh, the, our voice over IP system has an app that goes along with it so that when your phone would have rang at your, at your desk, it also rings on your, your phone. Um, I think it, that's unique to the voice over IP system that we use though. So, but, but you might check if you've got a voice over IP system, they probably have an app associated with that. Um, the other thing that um, I, I think Jenny Farrell was the one who mentioned um, a Google voice number. So maybe she could speak on that. Yeah, um, we just bought Google Voice numbers for everyone because it was cheaper than buying cell phones for everyone. I mean, there is technically some, what do you do? You like press star 67 or something to protect your cell phone, but that is, um, you know, everything is hackable is pretty much my, <laughs> my belief. Um, so people can get around that and figure out what your personal cell phone number is, even if you do that. So, um, you know, the next best thing, I mean, the best thing is just if you have the funds or can, you know, get someone to pay for um, getting cell phones for your whole staff, that's great. And if not, then um, Google Voice is $20 per month per user. So for us, that was the cheapest and best option. And that's been working well so far. Uh, this is Felisa Eiley from Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. Um, we use GoToConnect for our voice over IP, and there's an app that goes right to our phones. We can receive calls from our desk phone and text also, and the text is received like it is from our desk. Thank you all. And then in the chat, um, Jess also said there's a service called Curio Operator that folks can use. Um, so several tools. So another question is, um, some states are allowing remote notarization of documents via video chat or other means. Is anyone aware of a conversation about that happening in California? If you know the answer, feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, I'm hearing silence and seeing shaking heads. So I imagine as of right now, that's not a conversation that's happening. 
hopefully that will change. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, uh, it looks like someone's saying that one thing I worry about is that each provider is developing its own remote assistance platform without coordination. That seems inefficient and duplicative. If providers were to develop a collaborative or task force on developing a single platform for virtual clinics and no remote assistance, I'd be interested in participating. It definitely sounds like an exciting idea. If folks are interested in maybe participating in developing something like that, we can um, feel free to email Jenna and I after the fact and we can put you all in contact with each other. Can I, real quick, Theo, I mean, there's a couple of companies that are working on that. I know, Jay, you're, you work in pro bono, and there's a couple that are specifically for pro bono. One is uh, QMe, and the other that I'm aware of is Legaler. And they're both are like early stage startups, and their goal is kind of to create a large scale queue, large scale queue of pro bono attorneys that could be sort of, you know, you'd say that we're holding a clinic on workers' rights at 2 p.m. on X day, and they would all sort of, and you could you could have these clinics at different points in the county or the state, depending on the illegal issue, obviously. And there's sort of the pro bono attorneys would log on at that time and be sort of distributed to the various clinics. Um, those are both really early stage. They're really exciting. We've used one in a very limited sense for some of our remote pro bono work and it's been effective, but it, um, we've never done it in sort of this uh, mass ge geographic way that sort of it could work long term. So it's something to keep in mind. We'd be interested in that sort of thing as well. I think that we can obviously build a greater capacity. So. I'm going to chime in on QME. This is Sharon. Um, I, I have spoken to the owner in the last week just to see what's possible. They don't have a phone app yet. It's something that they are trying to work on and it's going to take some time, but there is capacity for clients if they have a home computer to log in that way. And then it looks like there's also the question of, I would, uh, someone would like to know more about remote notarization in California and what options are possible. So this is Selena. Um, I saw the question from Jay about each provider developing its own remote assistance platform. I know that the pro bono community is talking. Um, oh, um, I know the pro bono community is talking later today about some remote assistance platform. So if there's something that seems to be that folks agree work, then um, we'll definitely share that with the community. Is there anyone currently on the call who has knowledge about remote notarization in the state of California? Okay, uh, again, silence and shaking heads, I'm assuming. I'm a notary and I haven't heard anything. Okay, um, so if there are any last questions or topics folks want to discuss, again, feel free to either unmute yourself and chime in or let us know over Zoom. We'll give it a few more moments, and if not, I'll pass it over to Jenna to deal with the wrap up. I have a question. Um, we actually still don't have a case management software. Does anyone know if legal server or anyone is offering any sort of like COVID discounts for investing in those programs? I know that you guys have your text discount through LAC, which is awesome, but um, it would seem to me that now would be, it would be great if they could offer some sort of, you know, COVID discount. I don't know if you guys know them and could help us try and make that ask. That would be awesome. Jenny, I think you should call Ivy and ask him and then report out to the rest of us. Who's Ivy? Um, the legal server 
um, guy who tries to get LSOs to sign on. And then depending, since we already do work with them to get discounts, we might be able to contact them to see, given the circumstances, if they would extend or modify the discount. Anything else from anyone else? Okay, well, we are always here. Um, part of what we, like we do is we also try to coordinate around communication issues. So if at any point you folks have questions or additional needs around the technological aspects of this, feel free to email me. All my email will be in the follow-up. I'm definitely not an expert and probably won't know the answer, but I'd be happy to connect you to someone else in the community who is an expert. <laughs> so I'm going to pass it over to Jenna to conclude and give the final details. Thanks, Theo. And thank you so much for everyone who was a panelist and asked questions and spoke today. Um, it's been, this is obviously an ongoing conversation and we so appreciate your, your time and willingness to participate um, in this conversation with us. Um, we've been taking some notes and um, Theo and I will send out a follow-up email with the notes um, and a re captioned recording of this meeting so you can distribute it to any colleagues that weren't able to attend. Um, if you were someone who shared any resources, whether verbally or in the chat, I tried to capture them in the notes. Um, but if you find that they weren't captured, will you please just shoot either me or Theo an email so we can include those in the follow-up resources for folks. That'd be really, really helpful. And um, for those of you who want to continue the conversations um, or connect with one another. If someone said something really interesting and you want to connect with that person, just let either me or Theo, Theo know and we can um, set that up. Um, we also run webinars um, and we'd love to hear your feedback on whether or not like a webinar format would be helpful or if this conversation format is helpful. Um, so we'll send out a survey um, along with the resources as well and we'd really appreciate it if you could fill that out as well. Let's see. Um, Lastly, I want to thank Fenwick and West for generously sponsoring the Tech Summit and making it free and accessible to everyone. Theo, is there anything that I missed in that? I think you covered it all. Uh, so stay tuned. We'll be sending out an email with the notes and all of the resources that we've mentioned. Uh, thank you again so much for everyone who spoke and shared your knowledge, for everyone who asked questions, and for all the work you're doing in your communities and your organization to respond to this. This is definitely a dire, different situation. Um, so thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank, Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, everyone. Take care out there. Stay safe. Stay, stay well. Stay healthy. Goodbye. Good luck. Stay healthy, everybody. Bye, everyone. Take, Take care. Bye.